Hello, and welcome to Pixel History. Today we will learn a lot of interesting facts that you probably had no idea about, well, and never really cared for either. So without further ado, let's get right onto it. Tis the year 1769. America is having a revolution. French people are having enough of their monarchy. Poland, well, it's about to do what it does best, get invaded on one small Italian, well, independent, no, French island, we will be granted the gift of life. 15th of August, 1769, Napoleon was born into a minor noble family. As you can see by his stats, he wasn't really a great conqueror from the start. So maybe you still have a chance to do something meaningful in your life too. I mean, we all have to begin somewhere, am I right? His charisma and strength were not his greatest perks, but his ambition, oh boy, well there's no stat for it because it simply doesn't fit on the screen. After years of being beaten by his mum, which he somehow didn't mind, um, he moved out of Corsica to study in mainland France in a military school. He quickly learned that instead of being physically abused by his mum, he will now be bullied by his peers on account of his accent and his origin. Upon graduating, he left his toxic surroundings behind him and enlisted in the French army as an officer. His intelligence and charisma earned him a promotion and command over the siege of Toulon, where he defeated the English, further expanding his already big ego. After the fall of the Robespierre's, known for his military genius at Toulon, he was assigned to defend the government from a royalist uprising in Paris, which he did quite violently with cannons. The victory over the Royalists granted Napoleon a sudden surge of fame, favour of the government, and of course, money. One could say he had it all. Well, except for a wife. Even though charismatic, Napoleon was actually quite ugly. A rich, influential 27-year-old that nobody wants to marry. Sounds about right. To make him look good for a difference, I'll just add that he was actually average height for the time. For a reference, he's actually almost as tall as Dio. After miraculously marrying an older woman, desperate enough to marry him, that didn't well, let's say, have the best reputation, he left Paris to take command of the army of Italy. Even though his troops were low on morale and supplies, his very high charisma stat allowed him to go on an offensive victory streak, quickly knocking Piedmont out of the war. Which was quite honestly surprising to everyone as the Italian campaign was meant to be more of a distraction rather than the main front that it quickly became. The Austrians tried to counterattack, but they were defeated in a series of battles at Castiglione, Bassano and Rivoli. After the Battle of Tarvis, the French army under the command of Napoleon were all the way in the Austrian heartlands, 100 kilometers away from Vienna. That's when they decided to sue for peace, ceding northern Italy to France in the Treaty of Leoben. After fading Austria, Napoleon had to face France's biggest enemy, England. Even though a great tactician on land, he was not strong enough to defeat the British Navy. So he went on a trip to Egypt to undermine British trade interests in India. He gathered a team of scientists and archaeologists to do research on things that the British hadn't stolen yet and landed in Alexandria. He defeated the Mamluk forces at the Battle of Shabraki. The battle has provided later much needed experience for Napoleon's men at the Battle of the Pyramids. He crushed the Mamluk forces yet again, using only 200 men while inflicting 20,000 Mamluk casualties. Even though victorious, Napoleon had to halt his offensive in the Middle East due to Horatio Nelson's victory in the Battle of the Nile. With the conquest of Arish, Gaza, Jaffa, Haifa, Napoleon was forced to retreat his army back to Egypt because of outbreaks of the bubonic plague, executing or leaving many wounded and sick men behind. He then victoriously came back to France, not mentioning any of the war crimes or atrocities he committed, and was welcomed back as a hero. Before we begin with what happened next, let's have a look at how his stats have changed. To an increase in popularity, he could use the fact that when he came back from Egypt, France was in a rather tough spot. The war with the Second Coalition wasn't going very well and the Republic was broke. The French people had enough of the directory which Napoleon, being Napoleon, obviously used to overthrow the government in a swift coup d'etat, quickly making himself the first consul and basically becoming a dictator. He then crossed the Alps just like Hannibal did 2000 years before, surprised the Austrians at the Battle of Marengo, 
Though a great victory, the Austrians were still eager to fight, due to British support. Their enthusiasm was quickly struck down by Napoleon at the Battle of Hohenlinden, after which they obviously capitulated. Two years later of pointless warfare and death, Europe was finally at peace. Economy recovering and Napoleon's reputation higher than ever before. With Europe not at war anymore, some people didn't really see the need for Napoleon. So naturally, they tried to get rid of him. There have been six assassination attempts on Napoleon, 50% of which were stabbing attempts alone, whereas the other 50% included poisoning and an attempt to blow him. He supposedly survived the latter thanks to his drunk coachman, who simply drove too fast for the assassins to detonate the charges on time. Maybe all the stabbing attempts made him a bit paranoid, I don't know because he crowned himself the Emperor of the French. After Napoleon's controversial decision to execute the Duke of Enghien, the Third Coalition was formed. Naturally, in 1803, Great Britain declared war on France. All the other allies joined in on the fun soon after. But, of course, there were a few problems. Neither France nor England could carry out a successful invasion of each other's lands, as they were separated by the English Channel. England had a huge advantage on sea, whereas Napoleon was stronger on land. At first, Napoleon was trying to distract the British Navy by the use of the Franco-Spanish fleet. Meanwhile, his army would cross the Channel and be on their way to London. But as you can imagine, the plan didn't really work out that well. So, after the decisive Battle of Trafalgar, where the Franco-Spanish forces failed to defeat the British Navy, Napoleon's ambitions to conquer the British Isles were halted in their tracks. The sad news of Napoleon's defeat at Trafalgar was sweetened by his victory over the Austrians at the Battle of Ulm. Similarly to the Second Coalition, Austria was losing all the major battles to Napoleon. Although this time around they actually had friends. Which in the end didn't really make a difference at all as they were crushed at the Battle of Austerlitz. Following the major defeat at Austerlitz, Austria sued for peace and signed the Treaty of Pressburg. Naturally, as it always is after a war, France gained some lands in Italy, Bavaria and Germany. And also, the Holy Roman Empire was dismantled and later replaced by the Confederation of the Rhine. The sudden change in European politics has seriously alarmed Prussia, which up to now was pretty much chilling. The Prussian king, Frederick Wilhelm III, was not very keen on going to war. Unlike his wife, who apparently was the only one that grew up here in their family. So, being the simp that he was, he declared war upon the French and decided that he will defeat Napoleon himself. As you can guess, he quickly lost at the Battle of Jena and Auerstadt. Even though he had his ass handed to him by Napoleon, Frederick was still refusing to negotiate peace, believing that the Russians would come to his rescue. To nobody's surprise, they got their ass whooped again at the Battle of Friedland. After many questionable political maneuvers, Spain rebelled against Napoleon. Exotica. While he was out dealing with emperor business, and by emperor business, I mean sucking Alexander I, his generals were not competent enough to defeat the Spanish rebels nor the now intervening British army. So he stopped whatever he was doing with Alexander and went back to Spain to take control of his army in person. After swiftly driving the British out of the Iberian Peninsula, Napoleon had to deal with the Austrian problem. Last time I remember it was the Austrians dealing with problems. After facing a major defeat at Ekmo, the Austrian forces had to retreat behind the Danube, only to meet Napoleon's forces yet again at the Battle of Aspernesling where they actually stopped Napoleon from forcefully marching across the Danube. You'd think that after suffering such heavy losses, and still losing, Napoleon would rethink his strategy for the battle. But no. He just brought more men. To rush straight through the river, as if it was B-side on dust too. After a short pursuit, he managed to defeat the Austrians at the Battle of Bagram, forcing the Austrians to oh, sue for peace. Shit. The Treaty of Schönbrunn was the harshest peace deal forced on the Austrians by far. Three years have passed since the last major conflict in Europe. It was about time for Napoleon to commit some serious war crimes yet again. Although this time, it won't be as easy. 
It is the summer of 1812, and Napoleon has just launched the invasion of Russia. The Russians, being smart enough to avoid any direct contact with Napoleon, started retreating deeper into their heartland. As the last time they faced Napoleon didn't really end very well. The Russians tried to offer some resistance to Napoleon at Smolensk, but were defeated and continued with the retreat. As winter was closing in, so were the Russians retreating even deeper into their motherland. The Russians tried resisting the French invasion in Moscow, but failed to do so yet again. Napoleon was not expecting what he was about to see. You might think that this is in another great victory for our protagonist, but no. It is actually very, very far from that. In fact, Russians were using scorched earth tactics while retreating deeper into their environmentally unfriendly Russian heartlands. This would stop the French from accessing any supplies from the Russian soil, therefore starving and freezing to death. Realizing that he was in a trap, Napoleon ordered a mass retreat. Naturally, Russians having the upper hand started a pursuit. This was a huge defeat for Napoleon. That was the direct cause of his sudden downfall. At the beginning of the campaign, the Grande Armée counted over 400,000 men. And sadly, only 10% of them made it back. By the end of his fruitful career, we can see that Napoleon has not particularly aged very well. His intelligence and health stat have dropped drastically, making him more predictable and less adaptive. His charisma though, at an all-time high. Fame as his ego, and the chances of being <coughs> defeated by the allied forces. Well, let's just say he's in a bit of a tight spot. Miraculously, avoiding capture at Berezina, Napoleon has returned to France to rebuild his Grande Armée, which he did amassing a force of 350,000 men. Initially victorious Napoleon did the Allies generous peace offer that would in fact allow him to remain the Emperor of the French. His victories would not last long. He lost at the Battle of Leipzig, which was by far one of the bloodiest battles of the Napoleon Wars. After that, the Allied forces were quick to take control of Paris, which resulted in a general mutiny of Napoleon's forces, forcing him to abdicate. In the Treaty of Fontainebleau, he was exiled to a small island of Elba, greatly humiliated by the fact Emperor Napoleon, because he still had his title, tried to kill himself with poison that he was carrying around him. Unfortunately, it was long expired and it just gave him a stomachache. And to be honest, it really just sounds like attention seeking at this point. I mean, if he really wanted to die, he could have just yeeted himself off the freaking cliff. After some time in exile, he was bored and returned to France. A small boat with 700 of his men. The newly crowned king of France, Louis XVIII, sent men after men to capture Napoleon, only for them to join their former emperor on the march to Paris commanding over 200,000 men to try to split the British and Prussian forces, but failed to do so and was defeated by Prusso-English forces at Waterloo, and abdicated yet again. This time exiled to the remote island of St. Helena, where he sadly passed away due to the poor conditions the British had forced him to live in. Even though he didn't really accomplish all of his ambitions or plans, we cannot deny that he had a huge impact on our world. So yeah, I guess that would be the end of Napoleon. Um, first of all, thank you all for watching this video and sacrificing a little bit of your time for, I don't know, um, seeing this abomination that I had created in my spare time. Um, so yeah, till, till the next time. Goodbye.